Hey everyone, this is Adriana from Roadie Free Radio. In this clip, Larry talks to Sandy Warren, co-writer and executive producer of Horn from the Heart, and David Dunn, author of Guitar King, at a panel discussion about Michael Bloomfield and Paul Butterfield. Here, these three discuss the beginning of Bloomfield and Butterfield's blues careers and how their differences were like matching gasoline despite not getting along. If you want to hear more about Bloomfield and Butterfield, make sure to check out the full episode number 151 from November 28, 2019. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subbing. Here is Larry. Tell us a little bit about these two guys. Is this this shot from around that time? That, right? That's yeah. from the actual festival. That's yeah. from the festival. Yeah. So at that time, 65, who are those two guys? Well, uh, the guy on the... What, what you want to address this, Sandy? Do you want to talk about it? I mean, talk about Butterfield, and I, yeah, I can talk Butterfield about it. Butterfield had uh, just gotten a contract um, with Electra to uh, record. Um, Paul Rothschild, one of the guys who worked for Electra, had come to Chicago and heard him, and actually he was the one that kind of encouraged him to bring Michael into the band during that trip. That's true. That's true. And um, uh, he... So he had just signed that. He also, there's a, a great story that, that his brother tells that, you know, Paul Rothschild had come out, decided to sign in the band, and this band was playing locally in, in the clubs, you know, in, um, eventually on the north side um, of Chicago, but they never really had aspirations to be a national, international, you know, top band. I don't think it ever occurred to them this could happen. So all of a sudden this is happening. He opens his mailbox and there's his uh, electric, electric contract and his draft notice. And that was very, very frightening at that time. And um, there's a whole long story about how at that there was a window when there was a marital exemption from the draft. And a very dear friend of Paul's who worked as a barmaid in, in the club, I think it's Big John's where he was working then, was very uh, anti-war. And she said, look, we're gonna get married. You're not gonna go to Vietnam. You're gonna go on with your career. And I have, you know, you have to agree to this. So they did, they got married for that reason. And they had Gabe. And they had Gabriel. And we're grateful that they did. I mean, you know, that they got married because. Imagine, yeah. So that's sort of, so anyway, so he gets, at, uh, at some point, I think it was, the, the guys, it was Jack Holtzman, who was the founder of Electra, wanted uh, Paul to have somebody representing him in negotiating the contract. So he recommended uh, Grossman, Albert Grossman, to be Paul's manager. He was also the manager of Janis Joplin and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and... Um, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, duh. Um, so he comes to, to Newport, you know, on the heels of all of that. And, and, you know, Albert, of course, was there rounding up all his people. Um, and I think, Al, well, I'm not exactly sure how it came to be that Peter Yarrow is the one that appeared before the board, um, the board of the Newport Folk Festival. He was a board member. Yeah. He was. Yes. But how, what inspired him? So was Grossman. Okay, yes, Grossman. So Grossman's how, one of the founders of the festival. That must have been the connection, because he got up there and convince the board very late in the game to add the Butterfield Band as one additional act. And he had to sort of convince uh, skeptical board members that this was the thing to do. Well, there's a long um, description of that by um, Joe Boyd uh, in, in our film. And um, so I think this was maybe the first big, you know, gig for the Butterfield Blues Band. Outside of Chicago, obviously. Yeah. yeah, this would sort of break them Launching to the, to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And who's Michael at this point? <laughs> well, Michael um, started at Big John's in 1964, uh, brought blues, electric blues, to the, to the north side. And uh, when he left Big John's, it was Paul that he convinced to take the job. Uh, at Big John's, and Bloomfield's band called The Group, because nobody really had a name for it, uh, had kind of broken the ice and brought this really high energy, uh, loud, raucous party music to the north side, which was largely folk clubs at the time, you know, 
folk music was predominant. And so they were very successful, and they kind of made the scene at Big John's, which prior to that time had been sort of a, you know, a nondescript bar on Well Street in Old Town. And, but when Butterfield arrived, Butterfield had two guys out of Holland Wolf's band, uh, Jerome Arnold on bass and Sam Lay on drums, and they just tore it up. I mean, it, it became in a massive scene. And meanwhile, Bloomfield had gone north to a place called Magoo, Magoo's up in Bryn Mawr, way up north, and it was reputed to be a mafia joint, and they were paid very well, but there was nobody there. I mean, you know, the, the, the guys moving the stuff in and out of the back of the storeroom were busy with other things, not paying any attention to the music. So when Rothschild, as you said, Paul Rothschild, producer for Electric Re Electra Records, showed up to hear Butterfield on Fritz Richmond's recommendation. Uh, In the kettle of fish. Yeah, that's right, yes. And, uh, and trivial pursuits. And Butterfield said, well, you know, there's this other guy, he plays good electric guitar, maybe you want to check him out too. So right away Rothschild said, Get that guy in your band. Let's have all. Let's put them together. You know. And Butterfield said, "Well, no. Paul's um, Michael has his own band, and he's doing his own thing." And by that time, Bloomfield had a contract with Epic Records that was basically going nowhere because they were looking for another Dave Clark Five group, not what Michael was doing. Um, this was the deal with um, John Hammond, that was senior, yeah, with John Hammond, the producer. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, so the two guys you see in the picture here. Uh, weren't really friends, though they looked very friendly. As you heard Michael say in, in the clip, the interview clip, you know, he wasn't too comfortable with, with Paul because Paul was very serious and very hardcore. Very hardcore. Yes, about his blues. And he saw Michael as this sort of whiz-bang, showboating rock and roll kid who would come down to the south side with his crew of gaggly teenagers and they'd all sit at a front row table and when Muddy Waters wanted to go freshen his drink, Michael would jump up and play a few licks, and then he would leave. And Paul was living down there, you know, he lived in Hyde Park, which is on the south side, and he was working with Smokey Smothers in the club. He clubs. was born down there, right? He was born, yes, he yeah. was born in Hyde Park. Yeah, his mother worked for the Dean of Students at the university, yeah. And uh, so, Michael had this amazing energy and Paul had this extremely powerful sound, and the two of them together were uh, just like a match in gasoline. They just yeah. would light the, the, the place up. So they were the perfect combination, but despite the fact that they looked very jovial and friendly, they weren't, didn't quite get along that well. Some people said that Michael was afraid of Paul because he was so hardcore, and so, you know, Michael grew up going to good schools, even though I guess he was in and out of them, but still. Um, they just, you know, he was afraid of them. He's, you know, yeah, he went said into as the much, pit, carried yeah. a gun, Paul. He, he was the real Chicago blues guy. He was the real deal. Yeah. It's interesting, though, that for not really getting along or not being as jovial together as this, that Michael chose to stay with Butter and not go on with, with Dylan or to wherever else he could have gone. Yes, that is interesting. Well, I think, as Michael said in interviews later, that he really... Uh, knew that with Bob, because Bob was really a big star at that time, he knew that he would have to defer to Bob's presence and he wouldn't be able to move his fingers as much as he yeah. would like to, as he said. And with Paul, the whole deal was Michael was the soloist, let's go, you know, play. So that I think was very compelling for him. And even though Bob was a superstar and he really liked Bob, uh, he Felt better with Paul. Hey, what's happening, roadies? It's Larry here. Just wanted to thank you so much for listening to this short clip. I really hope you got something out of it. If you can take two seconds to head over to iTunes and drop us a review or a comment, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Keep listening. Keep coming back. Stay healthy out there. And remember, no roadies, no rock and roll.